Coming up, breaking the mold with 3D printing. Additive manufacturing has the potential to, to truly revolutionize manufacturing. The best ground game in the Big Ten. We always say that Penn State is the best place in the country to play college soccer. And the number one reason why is because of Jeffrey Field and the quality of the surface. A mysterious collection resurfaces. And he said, well, if you like that kind of stuff, uh, I want to show you some. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station. Hi, I'm Mike Zeman. Thanks for watching a special edition of SciTech Now. Every story you're about to see features Penn State scientists. Over the next 30 minutes, you'll see individual atoms and ancient artifacts. Let's begin in a lab that's on the forefront of 3D printing. The work is so advanced, it's getting the attention of the United States military. A great design begins with a great idea. It blends form and function to solve a problem. In manufacturing, design is limited by tools and technique. But the tools are changing, and the only limit is imagination. Additive manufacturing has the potential to, to truly revolutionize manufacturing. And an important aspect is the ability now to capture the manufacturing process in a digital environment. The best analogy I have is Minecraft, right? Where kids will play for hours putting little blocks in the right thing to create, a, create this integrated structure. We can do that with this technology. Additive manufacturing is the industry term for what you probably know as 3D printing. Machines that use polymers or metal to build something one layer at a time. Penn State's Applied Research Lab, or ARL, is home to some of the most precise equipment on the market. With additive manufacturing, you have the, the machine doesn't care whether you're, you're building a solid block or you're building a very, very thin wall structure. And so if you think about it, we could go 70 to 100 microns, basically about half of a human hair. We could build a wall that thick now out of metal. And detail like that is changing some very basic assumptions. One of the biggest things we see is challenging designers to think differently. I mean, we, I joke, you know, well, why are holes circular? Well, it's because that's how we're used to drilling them. They don't need to be anymore, right? And just, they still, you can just sort of see their minds start to explode when they're like, what? I don't have to have a circular hole? Uh, and so things like that, which is really just, just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to additive. These machines haven't broken the mold, they've replaced it. You're watching what's called directed energy deposition, it's just one of the machines at ARL's SIMP 3D facility. Basically how it works is there's four copper nozzles down at the bottom of this cone um, that feeds powder out in all directions, and then a laser comes down through the center of this portion, and then any time the laser's on, the powder's underneath it, the, the material will fuse into place. It's like welding with uncanny accuracy. The machines can create new objects and repair old ones. It can even use multiple materials on a single build, metals like titanium, stainless steel, aluminum, and nickel alloys. Powder bed fusion is a different approach. They actually take a vat of powder and they will scrape a small layer on the order of 20 to 60 microns across uh, your building plane, and then the laser will solidify that layer. The layers are so fine, complicated builds can take days, but the precision is appealing. One aspect that we're deeply involved with and, and have several actually ongoing programs is the application of the technology for sustainment of military systems. For the military, additive manufacturing could mean parts on demand, saving time and money by keeping aging equipment in service longer. But there's a catch. A lot of the standards and protocols that we use for uh, you know, measuring the powder, the process, making sure it's re repeatable and re reproducible, isn't out there for additive yet. Before a part can go into service, the results need to be predictable, and that means extensive testing. Qualifying a flight critical component for the Department of Defense can take years. Researchers want to know how the powder performs and if it can be reused. The machines are continually tested for consistency. The parts undergo even more scrutiny. They're tested for strength and fatigue and examined layer by layer for anomalies but the attention to detail has led to a critical success. The Applied Research Lab partnered with Naval Air Systems Command, or NAVAIR, to make this flight possible. This is a historic moment. 
the Navy's first manned flight with a critical component created through the additive manufacturing process. It's a titanium link and fitting, small enough to fit in your hand. One of four identical parts that helps hold an engine to the wing of V-22 Osprey. The piece was wired during the flight, letting engineers measure performance in real time. This was just a demonstration, the first step towards formal certification, but the Navy has already identified six additional safety critical parts they plan to test over the next year. A clear signal the military is planning on a future with additive manufacturing. I think it's on the rise, but there's a lot of like bumps to get through first. It is very expensive, so people think that we're gonna be additively manufacturing everything when that's not actually the case. We're gonna be picking the things that would be best additively manufactured to like lower the cost of them. Bottom line, don't expect a 3D printer like this in every home, at least not yet. Sure, 20 years, this is gonna be pretty mainstream. I think even within the next three to five years, you're gonna start seeing it uh, sort of more, used more frequently. I, I sort of joke, nobody wants to be first, but then nobody wants to be last either. Before we start our next story, a quick lesson about the nanoscale. A nanometer is roughly the length your fingernail grows in one second. A human hair is 100,000 nanometers thick. But that's not too small for science. Materials measured in nanometers exist, and they're being made at Penn State. Meet Frank. Frank is a furnace. A furnace that heats up to about 2,400 degrees Celsius. That's about one-third the temperature of the sun. And the J.A. Robinson Research Group at Penn State's Material Research Institute uses it to make something called graphene. Graphene is the first of what's being called 2D materials. They're strong, thin enough to be measured in atoms, and have the potential to change electronics forever. Electrons can move faster in this material than any other material known to man. So that means it's like a super highway for electrons. The speed at which they are able to travel is on the order of about 100 times faster than silicon. The comparison to silicon is important. Right now, silicon is at the core of every computer chip. Those chips use transistors to process the information going into or heading out of your cell phone or computer. Right now, industry giant Intel is using silicon to make a 14 nanometer transistor, the smallest on the market. You can fit about 5,000 of them across the width of a human hair, and each one can send more than 100 billion electronic signals every second. 2D materials could make those transistors even faster. We're hitting the limit of being able to make it smaller and smaller without needing to put in a lot more power and a lot more electricity into it. And so we're actually looking at new materials that could potentially replace silicon so that we can make more powerful or more energy efficient devices. If you're able to do that, then you're able to continue bringing things online, like making, enhancing virtual reality. So you can make, because it takes a huge amount of computing, computation, um, uh, effort. But before these materials can be used in electronics, they need to be produced and perfected in the lab. That means using high-tech furnaces like Frank to continually make the materials and high-tech lasers like Lucy to examine them. The things that we're growing are things that we can't see. And so we need to actually identify that what we thought we just made is in fact the thing that we just made. We will shoot laser lights at materials uh, in spectroscopy, and the materials will reflect the laser light coming back to the instrument. This process is called Raman spectroscopy. The light bouncing back is shown by something called a spectra. Scientists use it to determine the quality of the material. If they need a closer look, they use this. The Titan Electron Microscope, a crown jewel of Penn State's Materials Research Institute. It is powerful enough to see individual atoms. That means imperfections, no matter how small, have no place to hide. The process at Penn State is slow. The biggest chip manufacturers can make billions of silicon transistors every second. Members of the Robinson Group are working with a single sample at a time. In order for us to be able to make that amount of volume, um, we basically need to take what we can do with the state-of-the-art tools and science and basically scale it up to industrial levels. And that's not very easy because when you scale something, a process up to that level, there's 
a lot of things that change. But these scientists believe they're building a solid foundation that'll push 2D materials closer to the mainstream. Graphene research, 2D research at this point is still very much an academic exercise, but there are a lot of people, including ourselves here at Penn State, that are really trying to push this so that it goes beyond academia and, and really does make an impact on our everyday life. We know that we're working on something that is next generation technology, so that's really exciting. Not all science happens in the lab. Up next, we'll take you to the field where researchers are starting from the ground up in hopes of taking some of your favorite sports to the next level. In science, few fields get more exposure. You see it every week on TV, perfect grass that puts your yard to shame. But there's more to these manicured fields than sunshine and soil. This is just the surface of a serious science and an estimated $60 billion industry. When you consider the, the entire Chesapeake Bay watershed, it's been estimated recently it's the largest crop in the entire watershed. There's more turf than corn, for example. You heard right. More turf than corn, roughly 3 million acres, or nearly 10% of the total land area. Pete Lanscoot is a professor of turf grass science at Penn State, a program with roots reaching back to 1928 when a group of golf course superintendents, including a man named Joseph Valentine, asked the university to help them grow better grass. A professor named Bert Musser, who was a clover breeder, was appointed to have a halftime position in turf. So that was during the late 1920s, and the program started very slowly through the 30s into the 40s. If you could go back to the 1950s and look at some of the grasses back then and compare them to what we have today, it's like night and day. Today, the science continues here, the Joseph Valentine Turfgrass Research Center, dedicated in 1970. It's 17 acres of bluegrass, ryegrass, fescue, and bentgrass, grass so green and so short, our photographer Tyler thought it was fake. But on a small plot in the back corner, we got an up-close look at how turfgrass science is evolving and impacting sports at every level. But before we explain this, we need to explain why the playing surface is so important to elite athletes. So we asked the defending national champs, the Penn State women's soccer team, to break it down. We always say that Penn State is the best place in the country to play college soccer. And the number one reason why is because of Jeffrey Field and the quality of the surface. We play on some other fields that they might be turf, they might be a different kind of grass. But honestly, when we play on a field like this, it's the best surface and we have our best touches and our best moments out here. We've had a moment where our goalkeeper has slipped on a surface in an away match, and it cost us the game, right? One, one moment, one instance can cost you a match. So often soccer games are one nothing or 2-1, and that one goal makes all the difference in the world. For the players, performance is everything. But the glory of the game can fade in the face of injury, and that brings us back to the science. And Andrew McNitt, He's the director of the Penn State Center for Sports Surface Research. A player interacts with the surface in two ways. They either fall on it or they have a player to shoe to surface interaction. So what we want to do is look at making that field very playable but at the same time safe. Defining a surface-related injury can be complicated, but studies dating back more than 30 years link about 20% of sports injuries to the playing surface. 
The most serious include sprains, broken bones, ligament damage, and concussions. To improve safety, McNitt and his colleagues are focusing on two key factors, traction and surface hardness. We look at methods in both synthetic and natural to try to make that surface um, softer when a player impacts that surface. So that would try to lower our chances of concussions. At the professional level, field managers across the country measure surface hardness with one of these, a Clegg impact hammer. It looks a little like a bicycle pump. Here's how it works. The user drops a weight and an accelerometer measures how fast it stops. The harder the surface, the higher the score. And testing like this is mandatory in the National Football League, and it's something McNitt would like to see at all levels. We've actually heard from some administrators at high schools in the past that we don't want to know because then we're liable if we know. However, those days are almost gone. Uh, the idea that you can just put your head in the sand and pretend like these issues don't exist is rapidly uh, becoming a, a, an old thought. But not all athletes can choose where they play. If you can't pick your field, what you put on your feet can make a big difference. While there is a difference between synthetic turf and natural turf as far as the amount of traction it provides, that difference is, is this large. And when we start to look at the difference due to shoes, that, that becomes much larger. So shoe selection by coaches, athletes, parents, trainers is very important. Safe or unsafe traction levels haven't been established, but McNitt and his colleagues are looking into it. They've tested dozens of cleats and maintain a database on their website. We don't have a safety cutoff, but we sort of have a gradient and you can pick uh, a shoe that is medium in traction so you could try to reduce injury that way. Parents should simply be aware that the equipment that their youth athlete wears is often as important as the surface they're playing on. You can't have one without the other. The next big thing in food could be bugs. It may sound disgusting, but it could be a promising solution to global hunger. Still not convinced? Maybe these Penn State scientists can change your mind. So today we are actually tasting bugs and putting bugs in our food. The muscles in an insect are pretty much the same kinds of muscles that you would find in a chicken wing, chicken wing, chicken wing, chicken wing. Okay, wait. I can explain. We're at Penn State's Great Insect Fair. If it crawls, flies, or flutters, you can find it here. But this is no freak show. Our biggest problem as entomologists is exposing people. I mean, people are scared and people are tentative, especially about this stuff and putting stuff in their mouth or touching it or whatever. It's because they don't know. Well, I think a lot of children start out being interested and curious about the natural world. And I think maybe as you grow older, it seems to fade away as people tell you you should be afraid of it. If someone told these kids to be afraid, they weren't listening. What's your favorite part of the podcast? I gotta see the cockroach so far. Cockroach. My favorite kind of bug is a little tiny ant. A little tiny ant. Well, all bugs are my favorite. If this fair is a battle for hearts and minds, the entomologists are winning. And some hope their influence will extend from the classroom all the way to the dining room. After this, I'm gonna go over to the insect deli. It's true, these scientists want you to eat bugs. You're probably asking why. You can do it. Bugs as a product uh, that you add to foods are very nutritionally dense. They have high levels of protein, uh, healthy fats, as well as other uh, micro and other macronutrients. Nutrients like amino acids, calcium, iron, and zinc. When it comes to protein, an insect like a cricket is right up there with meat and milk. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, Insects will be a main ingredient in the fight against global hunger and the effort to meet the demands of a growing population. The UN estimates 9 billion people will be living on planet Earth by 2050. 
Not only will we need more food, but we'll need more space. And insects require less land, less water, and because they're cold-blooded, less food than traditional livestock. You can get the same amount of protein from crickets as you can from cows for one twelfth of the food, leaving more resources for humans. This isn't a wild idea. About two billion people around the world eat insects regularly. So why shouldn't we? refreshing. It's crisp. <laughs> Delicious. Crisp. Crispy yeah. crisp. It's good. There we go. All right. Okay. No goo, no guts, just crunch. Realistically, the scientists here know they aren't going to change your grocery list overnight. But with a little exposure and a little education, big things are possible. Be open to learning more about them. Because we're only really afraid of things we don't know about. Once you learn, you'll, you'll come to love them. Everyone's dabbled in their own little corner of entomology, and it's so big, it's spread. We have engineers, we have the, the pest management, we just have the people that are doing it for the beauty of it. I don't know, I guess it's just the, uh, the potential. Bugs always come with a story, and they just do one of everything. It's just amazing. A wood collection doesn't sound very exciting. In fact, students and faculty at Penn State ignored a rare collection for more than 40 years. But one professor knows it has potential. He just needs to decode its past. From here, look at Dr. Charles Ray has spent the last three years updating a spreadsheet. 1,500 entries and counting. Each line contains names, dates, and locations. It's tedious work, part data entry, part mystery. A mystery that may have been lost to time had Ray, a Penn State professor, not written a blog post about collecting wood. I got a knock on my office door and uh, opened the door and it was Dr. Bob Baldwin. And he said, well, if you like that kind of stuff, uh, I want to show you something. He pulls out a set of keys, opens it up, and there's this wood collection stuck in this big walk-in closet. And I said, what is this? And he said, well, it's a university wood collection. Drawer after drawer stuffed with palm-sized wood samples and some important paperwork that gave Ray, a diehard Sherlock Holmes fan, his first clue. Documents trace the collection back to 48 original samples donated in 1909. More than 100 years later, Ray found more than 5,000 specimens in that closet, the sum of some 30 different collections. The only real attempt to organize it started in the late 1950s by a Penn State professor named Newell Norton. And he had been doing that for more than 10 years, as far as I can figure, and he unfortunately passed away. And he was, uh, see them right there in the middle, he was kind of right, right in the middle of those boxes that there when he passed away. So that was a big problem, is that about half of it then is documented and organized, and the other half is still sort of a mystery that I have yet to solve. A recent donation added about 6,000 samples making this one of the largest university collections in the country. If you take a close look, you'll find some interesting stuff, like a hunk of wood taken from an Egyptian tomb, a slice of something called Welwitchia. It's so rare, Ray thinks it's one of three or four samples available to collectors, and a stump found near Ontario that's carbon dated at 8,700 years. It's interesting because it was down in the bog and deprived of air and everything else. It's not petrified. It's still a piece of uh, wood, woody wood. In another three years, Ray hopes to have about eight or 9,000 samples identified and labeled in a searchable database. Good thing, because after 44 years on the shelf, this collection is more popular than ever. There are several people around the world that are waiting for me to finish this process so that I can share our list with them so they can see what we've got. 80 years ago, in fact, 100 years ago when this collection was started, it was really just more about collecting them and having them and not exactly knowing what you're going to do with it. With advancements in imaging, computing power, and biological testing, samples like these could mean new breakthroughs in genetics and molecular composition. And if the past is any indicator, that could mean new breakthroughs in medicine. Pacific U was a poisonous tree. 
the medical researchers found out that the poison, the taxine that was in the plant itself, would actually kill cancer cells in breast cancer for women. Well, the interesting thing about that is if you think about it, you say, well, if they could do that for one disease, then you think about all these traditional medicines, it seems like we could synthesize those same chemical compounds to treat a myriad of other kinds of things like that. It may have started 300 years ago with the first scientist that looked through a microscope and identified the cell organism. And so in the short term run, that 300 years looks like, okay, that whole field is, has been conquered. But in reality, what we're seeing now is that it's just beginning to open up and who knows what's gonna come out of it. But first things first, he needs to finish that spreadsheet. Casey, uh, Thanks for watching this special edition of SciTech Now. You can watch full episodes on demand or online at wpsu.org slash digital. I'm Mike Zeman. Thanks for watching. Funding for this program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, and contributions to this station.